Hi, it's Drake. I just wanted to make a quick video about some contemporary poets that I've been thinking about. And they all have, the three of them happen to be female poets. I don't think I have any contemporary male poets. Yeah, I don't think I have any. Other than that one like Hungarian guy, but he doesn't write in English, so. Um, this video isn't out of any coercion. I just decided that, well, a couple days ago I was reading a comment on the Better Than Food channel. Someone commented that uh, he reads mostly male authors and uh, the commenter was a woman. She said, I read mostly female. Why do you think that is? Stuff like that. And um, I thought that more or less, if you read authors from, I'd say, before the, the 1900s, uh, if you want to educate yourself or read the best authors, they'll mostly be male. Um, no matter if you look really hard and try to find, you know, the uh, undiscovered female authors that are great, simply because to make a genius, everything has to go right. And... It's simply not enough could go right for most of the women that were alive in that time, either through education, through uh, family, you know, allowing them to pursue their talents, all this obvious stuff. But, um, yeah, I think it's mostly corrected itself. It's completely corrected itself nowadays, but... Um, <clears throat> anyway, I just decided to talk about three three authors. Uh, the first one is uh, A.E. Stallings, who I found when I was looking up. Uh, it was called New Formalism, I guess. But she's uh, the translator of that uh, The Nature of Things by Lucretius, that penguin translation. She translated it. She really likes, you know, Greek, I guess, ancient Greek. But uh, I don't know much about her. I first started reading her poems through that translation of uh, Lucretius, and then also on Poetry Foundation. She has she has some pretty funny poems. There's one I think it's called a Sestina, and it's on the word like. So I'm sure you can imagine what happens there, but. Uh, let's see. I marked two poems. Um, I got this collection of hers, Hay Packs. And I marked two poems on there. I'll just read them both. Talk a little bit about them, I guess. Alright, so this one's called Sisyphus. It is good to work the dumb obsessive muscles. Exertion draws the mind from hope to a more tangible object. To live is to relive. This can only work when there is an object to push cursive and recursive up the hill when you hope. This draws to no close as day withdraws, but will replay in dreams. You live in hope of dream work. It's regressive, infinite object. Awake abject the conscious mind draws into a ball the elusive tongues it like the pit of an olive the quirk of hope in recurrent nightmares is the hope at last to be the object of the murderer's handiwork when he draws the knife to relieve the stutter to make passive the massive machinery of hope the broken record of a lie. why object object the luck of all the draws is the weight of stone. Work without hope draws nectar in a sieve, and without and hope without an object cannot live. Apparently that's a quote from uh, Coleridge, which is a note in the back of the book. 
And then there's a second poem here in the same collection called Prelude. Lately at the beginning of concerts when the first chair violin plays the A440 and the bows go whirring about the instruments like wings over unfingered strings, the cycling fifths, spectral arpeggios, as the oboe lights the pure torch of the note, something in my throat constricts and te tears are startled to my eyes helplessly. And lately when I stand, torn ticket in my hand, in the foyers of museums, I surprise you with a quaver in my rote reply. Again I overbrim and corners of the room go prismed, dim. You'd like to think that it is truth and art that I am shaken by, so that I must discharge a freighted heart. But it is not when cellos shudder, shoulder the tune, nor changing of the key, nor resolution of disharmony, that makes me almost tremble, and it is not the ambered afternoon slanting through moats of dust a painter caught four hundred years ago as someone stands, opening the blank future like a letter in her hands. It is not masterpieces of first rank, not something made by once warm fingers, nothing painted, played. No, no, it is something else. It is something raw that suddenly falls upon me at the start like loss or awe the vertigo of possibility, the pictures I don't see, the open strings, the perfect intervals. So I don't think she's like necessarily, I would say I like modernist poets better than any poet writing nowadays, but I do appreciate this. And uh, it's pretty interesting. On the back of this book, there's there's an anti blurb, and it's and it goes like this: This is not necessary. This is neither crucial nor salvation. It is no hymn to harmonize the choirs of seraphim, nor any generation's bold bellwether leading the flock. No iridescent feather dropped from the muse's wing. It does not limb, or speak in tongues, or voice the mute, or dim outmoded theories with its fireworks. Rather. This is flawed and mortal, and its stains bear the evidence of taking pains. It did not have to happen, won't illumine the smirch of history, the future's omen. Necessity is merely what sustains. It's what we do not need that makes us human. Yeah. But I guess she's won some prizes and stuff, so. And then, um... So the, the second one I'll talk about is uh, Hera, Lin Hera Lindsay Bird, and the title of the book is Hera Lindsay Bird. And uh, I found this through uh, 4chan, <laughs> oddly enough. Someone, like, ironically uh, posted her poem, which I'm going to read later, and said, like, uh, you know, the future of poetry, that sort of thing. But I actually really like her stuff, and it's humorous in the way that I would say E.E. E. Cummings is, or um, Paul Blackburn has some poems like this. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I wouldn't call it great art <laughs> and I don't think it was written in that intention, but, uh, it is very funny, I think. So let's see. Hmm. Okay. So I'll read this one. It's called, uh, write a book. It's the first poem in the, in the book. To be 14 and wet yourself extravagantly at a supermarket checkout as urine cascades down your black lace stocking and onto the linoleum is to comprehend what it means to be a poet, to stand in the tepid under halo of your own self-making and want to die. Far away in a field of wild orchids is a backward sentimentality like a Christmas card with a robin scratched out. Well, 
It was Oscar Wilde who said sentimentality is the desire to have the luxury of an emotion without paying for it. Like when I masturbate and think of nuns, yet never go to church at Christmas. Now I have a master's degree in poetry and no longer wet myself, but I still have to die in antiquated flowers. Does this make me sentimental? Well, who's to judge? You can get away with anything in a poem, as long as you can say, my tits in it. But it's a false courage to be so modestly endowed and have nothing meaningful to say. You might think this book is ironic, but to me it is deeply sentimental, like if you slit your wrists while winking, does that make it a joke? To be alive is the greatest sentimentality there is, and I live to be sentimental, and I love to be alive, always weeping at the end of a movie over the frosted carriages of yesteryear. I wrote this book, and it is sentimental, because I don't give a right size re I don't have a right size reaction to the world. To write a book is not a right size reaction. To put all your bad thoughts on paper and to make someone else pay for them. My friend says it's bad poetry to write a book, and I agree with her. I agree with her in principle, but I wrote a book anyway, and I named it after myself. My name is Hera Lindsay Bird. This book is called Hera Lindsay Bird. I wrote it, and I mean at least 75% of it. And if that's not sentimental, well, one day I'm going to have to pay for it. Um, and then one other poem I liked of hers is called uh, Monica. And I'll just read, uh, I don't know, maybe I won't read this one. I'll read the second half of it. Um, which probably against the author's wishes. Ah, uh, you know what? I won't read it. I won't read it. But it's online, so you should read it because it's actually pretty funny. But uh, this next one I'm going to read is the poem that uh, <laughs> made me want to read more. And uh, I won't do it justice. I won't do the reading justice. So if there's any girl out there female woman, lady, who uh, wants to read this in a mild, in a mild ecstasy. I think that would be much better than my low, unenthusiastic voice, but uh, the title of this poem is Keats is Dead, So Fuck Me From Behind. Keats is dead, so fuck me from behind, slowly and with carnal purpose, some black midwinter afternoon with while all the children are walking home from school. Peel my stockings down with your teeth. Coleridge is dead and odd in two, of laughing in an overcoat. Shelley died at sea, and his heart wouldn't burn. And Wordsworth, they never found his body. His widow mad with grief, hammering nails into an empty meadow. Byron Whitman, our dog crushed by a garage door. Finger me slowly, in the snowscape of your childhood, our dead floating, just below the surface of the earth. Bend me over like our substitute teacher and pump me full of shivering arrows. Oh, emotional vulnerability. Bosnian folk song, birds in the chimney. Tell me what you love when you think I'm not listening. Wallace Stevens' mother is calling him in for dinner, but he's not coming. He's dead too. He died 60 years ago and nobody cared at his funeral. Life is real and the days burn off like leopard print. Nobody, not even the dead, can tell me what to do. Eat my pussy from behind. Bill Manhire's not getting any younger. Oh, and then that... <laughs> anyway, I really like that poem, and I don't care what that says about me. But uh, there's one line that I have always stuck in my head now, and that's from the, the Monica poem. It's the second to last line. Uh, I guess I'll read the, the little end part of it. Okay, read it first, but this is the part that I like. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'm falling in love and I don't know what to do about it. Throw me in a haunted wheelbarrow and set me on fire. And don't even get me started on Ross. But the line I like is, 
throw me in a haunted wheelbarrow and set me on fire. I always think of that. It's just like, like when you'd normally think of, you know, like, ah, you know, damn it all, you know, <laughs> throw me in a haunted wheelbarrow and set me on fire. But uh, anyway, that's that. It's published by the Victoria University Press in New Zealand. All right, and then the uh, third book is, which I think I mentioned on here before, it's uh, Or the Ambiguities by Karen Weiser, or Weiser. And I don't think it would do justice to read these poems because the uh, how it's arranged on a page is is uh, meaningful because as you can see this this is a quote in the the uh, book Pierre or the ambiguities by Herman Melville and then she will gradually take out words see these gaps that's where she's took taken words out and then she you know remains uh, words remain and you know it's kind of like a decay or something like that dripping but uh, I'll read the epigraphs epigraphs to the book and that'll give you an idea of I guess how it is so this first quote is from uh, Herman Melville from Pierre or the ambiguities it is not for man to follow the trail of truth too far since by doing so he entirely loses the directing compass of his mind for arrived at the pole to whose barrenness it only points there the needle indifferently respects all points of the horizon alike. And then this is from of William James from the Principles of Psychology, from chapter 9, The Stream of Thought. We ought to say a feeling of and, a feeling of if, a feeling of but, and a feeling of by, quite as readily as we say a feeling of blue or a feeling of cold. But uh, I really like this book, and it's published by the Ugly Duckling Press, which publishes good books, but they're always very expensive. Uh, but, yeah. I really like all three of these books, and I, I'd recommend them to anyone who's interested in contemporary poetry, I guess. And then I guess I'll do like a little section at the end here for what I've been... So when I was just thinking about making this video, for whatever reason, I started thinking about like paradoxes and things like that. Kind of like that Melville quote, which I didn't, I, I hadn't read before I started thinking about this. And uh, I guess it's part of um, reading Proust last week or so and listening to interviews and talks by Peter Thiel, the guy who helped found PayPal and stuff. Um, He's pretty much known for being a contrarian. Proust kind of does, like, you know, at least funny contrarian stuff. You know, that's part of what humor is, is unexpected things. And also, I when I think of, like, maybe contrarian stuff with, with no bad connotation to it, I think of uh, Kierkegaard, who... I think may be the most intelligent person I've encountered in my life, like like any any way, you know, books, music, um, in person. Um, that may be just an extravagant statement that doesn't have any meaning, but uh, <laughs> for a uh, like paradoxical contrarian passage, I wanted to read this section from either or. It's uh, called An Ecstatic Discourse, oddly enough. Marry, and you will regret it. Do not marry, and you will also regret it. Marry or do not marry, you will regret it either way. Whether you marry or do not marry, you will regret it either way. Laugh at the stupidities of the world, and you will regret it. Weep over them, and you will regret it also. Laugh at the stupidities of the world, or weep over them, you will regret it either way. Whether you laugh at the stupidities of the world or weep over them, you will regret it either way. Trust a girl and you will regret it. Do not trust her and you will also regret it. 
trust a girl or do not trust her, you will regret it either way. Whether you trust a girl or do not trust her, you will regret it either way. Hang yourself and you will regret it. Do not hang yourself and you will also regret it. Hang yourself or do not hang yourself, you will regret it either way. Whether you hang yourself or do not hang yourself, you will regret it either way. This gentleman is the quintessence of all the wisdom of life. It is not merely in isolated moments that I, as Spinoza says, view everything eterno modo in the mode of eternity, but I am continually eterno modo. Many believe they too are this when, after doing one thing or another, they unite or meditate these opposites. But this is a misunderstanding, for the true eternity does not lie behind either or, but before it. Their eternity will therefore be also be a painful temporal sequence, since they will have a double regret on which to live. My wisdom is easy to grasp, for I have only one maxim, and even that is not a point of departure for me. One must differentiate between the subsequent dialectic in either or, and the eternal one suggested here. So when I say that my maxim is not a point of departure for me, this does not have the opposite of being a point of departure, but is merely the negative expression of my maxim, that by which it comprehends itself, in contrast to being a point of departure or not being a point of departure. My maxim is not a point of departure for me, because I made it a point of departure. I would regret it, and if I did not make it a point of departure, I would also regret it. If one or another of my esteemed listeners thinks there is anything to what I have said, he merely demonstrates that he has no head for philosophy. <laughs> I just, I just love it so much. <laughs> I just, I just love it. And this book is, I'm, it's just, it, I enjoy it so much. Because he writes about Mozart in here. I mean, it's just perfect, really. And this is only uh, the first part. Uh, this is published by the Princeton University Press. The uh, this also has the Seducer's Diary in it, which I think may be the most famous part. I don't, I don't care. But yeah, long story short, I've been loving reading Proust. I may have revised my previous plan. I may just try to read it all through straight, although it is several thousand pages but I've already read more this year than I did all of last year so I'm on, I'm on a good string uh, I guess if anyone has any contemporary poets like maybe 30 40 years old that they think are worth reading 20 in the 20s ideally but uh, yeah, post them, let me know. If anyone wants to read that poem, I would appreciate it, because I did not do it justice. Uh, yeah, Death is a Gang Boss. 